It's one way, in Ukraine it's different. <laughs> I guess it makes it look too. <laughs> so it seems like now banana has like three ways to be open. I think the one thing you can tell Jeremy is that you can decide. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Okay, so we are here on page three. And talking about drawing a parallel between person and Torah. Person is made up of a nisham and a goof, and the Torah also has a nisham and a goof. The goof are the 248 organs, which are the 248 mitzvahs, and the nishama is the academic part of Torah, the learning, the understanding, and that's compared to the blood in the goof itself. <clears throat> And that's why we find that mitzvahs are more limited to time and space. And Teirah is not limited because Teirah is more than a shama. So a shama, which is more spiritual, is le less limited. By the way, there's a chapter in Tanya. Where the author explains that <clears throat> this is the reason why most mitzvahs, that in order to fulfill the mitzvah, you have to do an act, a physical act, in order to fulfill the mitzvah, like learning or um, brachas, davening has to be verbalized with your mouth. Because being that the whole point is to elevate the physical world, so the neshama itself, even though it's very high, but because that could be because it's so high and because it's so spiritual, it doesn't really connect to the physical and therefore it doesn't have an impact on the physical. How does the neshama have an impact on the physical because it's Mulubish and the Guf, through the Guf, it affects the physical world. So that's why we have to verbalize the brachas, verbalize benching, verbalize davening, and thought alone is not enough. Even though, of course, thought is so much deeper, so much more spiritual, so much more intense than just dry technical words. But when the, the, when the davening or the brachas and all these things will be just in the thought, when that became the mitzvah, because it can't elevate the physical. So on the surface, it appears that teira is higher than mitzvah. Teira is less limited. And like we said the other day, yesterday, that the way to measure, to define the difference between higher and lower, when you talk about things in the spiritual context, it's the less limited is higher, and more limited is lower. <clears throat> the 
Then the small paragraph he said that nevertheless there's a mila and mitzvahs over Torah. And here he pointed out two things. Number one is the source. That mitzvahs come from a higher place <laughs> compared to Torah. Torah comes from Hashem's Chochmah, which is very high, is the highest of the ten spheres. Mitzvahs are Hashem's will, Hashem's Ratzon. And Ratzon is higher than Chochmah. So the source of mitzvahs are higher than the source of Torah. And not only that, but even Torah mitzvahs, as they are not in their source, but the way they are in actuality, nevertheless, we also can see a mile of mitzvahs over Torah. And that is that the Torah that we learn is to accommodate the mitzvahs. It's all about learning how to do the mitzvahs. So basically, the Torah is accommodating mitzvahs rather than the mitzvahs are accommodating Torah. That means that mitzvahs are the goal, and the Torah is enhancing that goal. I just want to add something which might be obvious, but probably good to add. And that is, if Torah is higher than mitzvahs, so what does it mean that the source of the mitzvahs are higher? It's like saying that you have two people. One is a righteous person. One is not. And then you're going to say, but this person who is not righteous, his ancestor a few hundred years ago was the Rambam. The other person is a very nice person and righteous person, learns and davens as mitzvahs, is a very kind person, but he doesn't have a grandfather like the Rambam. So what does it make a difference whether his grandfather was the Rambam or not? Who were you? That's what really counts. So what are we saying? The source of mitzvahs is from a higher place. The source from Torah is from a lower place. Why does that make so much of a difference? The bottom line is, as we know, Torah mitzvahs, Torah is more spiritual, less limited, and mitzvahs are more limited. It's a general question about so many places in Chassidus. So what would be the general answer? It has to go to more if it comes from a higher place, it goes through more symptoms. So on the contrary, you're making it even more difficult. That means that it's even, even lower than, than the Torah. So the, the answer to this is not just answer to this. It's answer to many things in Chassidus. And more things we'll have soon in this timer when you say, this is this, but it comes from a higher source. And that is to remember the difference between Gashmis and Ruchmis. This is a little bit of an example of what we said yesterday, that when you're learning something new, a different kind of learning like Yerushalmi, you have to completely forget the old way of thinking. When we think of the roots or the source, basically the source is in a different place and a different time. So if I say this person, he, he comes from the Rambam. What does that mean? The Rambam lived 800 years ago and the Rambam lived in a different country, and you live here, so you two of you are very far apart from each other. When we say that something comes from a certain spiritual source, <laughs> where is the source, and where is the person, or the guf, or the Torah, or the mitzvahs? They're not separated by time, because there's no time in the spiritual realm. They're not separated by space, because there's no space in the spiritual realm. <laughs> so when we say that this comes from a certain source, where is the source? The answer is, the source is the inner, deeper dimension of that very thing. It's not someplace else. So if I say that, that um, mitzvahs come from keser, from Hashem's Ratzon, that means the inner, deeper identity and dimension of mitzvahs is Hashem's Ratzon. Not it was, it is now. That's the difference. When you talk about a source, the Gashmi is, it's distance in time. It was like that once upon a time ago. And it was like that in a different place. But again, in Ruchnis, there's no time and place. Like when we learn about Gashmis, and we say that the physical thing, we learned in the, about the Maim of Elam that a physical object that you elevate comes from the world of Tayu, which is higher. And other things come from the world of Tikkun, 
So what does it mean that it's high? It means not that it was once upon a time in that world. It means that right now, that higher level is the deeper inner subconscious dimension of what you're looking at. Anybody following me? Yeah, yeah? okay. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> Are you anybody? Okay. <laughs> um, so what would that mean practically? That means if this is the inner deeper dimension, that means even in the mitzvahs, the way they are here, which appear to be lower than Torah, they have to have a certain quality, a certain, a certain mila that Torah doesn't have because their inner deeper truer essence is something which comes from a much higher place. So now let's go to the bottom of page three. Also, let me just draw your attention to footnote number 17. And the Rebbe explains that even though we say that Torah is the neshama, is the soul, and mitzvahs are the body, but we know that in Kedusha, everything includes everything. That means in Torah itself, there's a soul and a body, and in mitzvahs themselves, there's a soul and a body. So what would be the soul and the body in mitzvahs? The practical act of the mitzvah is the body. The kavana, the thought, and the feeling that goes into it is the soul. And what would be the soul and body in Torah? Well, first of all, we know that the Rezoyah says that Nigla, the revealed part of Torah, is the body. The deeper, inner, esoteric meaning of that is the soul, is the neshama. And basically, there are really many levels in body and soul. Body means the external, and soul means what's internal. Okay. Their movement, so from this it's understood, that the same applies to the neshama and the guf of a person. Because we make growing the parallel between the neshama and guf in a person and the neshama and guf in Torah. What's, what's the parallel? What are we comparing? Even though the guf lives because of the neshama, the neshama is the one that um, gives life to the guf. So the neshama is higher. The neshama is the mashpia, and the guf is the makabal. The neshama is the giver, and the guf is the receiver. The guf in itself has no life in its own right, and the neshama is a living entity, and it gives life to the guf. Nevertheless, sheir shaguf, the root and the spiritual source of the guf, is higher than the source of the neshama. as it's explained in another place, that this idea that the guf has a higher source of the neshama has many different ramifications and it, it brings out many different things. <clears throat> so here he's focusing on the idea of, of Hashem's choice and Hashem's love for Yidin, how it's more with the guf than it is with the neshama. <clears throat> What is it? It's explained in another place. When we say that Hashem loves every yid, he loves our neshama and he loves our guf. But there's a difference between the bond between Hashem and the neshama and the bond between Hashem and the guf. I would think that the neshama is so much higher and so much greater. And here in the Maim is explaining, no, actually the guf is greater. A reference to the Nishama, it says, Bonim atem that Yidin are like children to the Abishta, which means that the connection between Hashem and the Yidin is like the connection and the love between parents and children. Just like the love of a father to his son, it's not a love that that's based on reason and logic. It's a natural love. 
because the son comes from the father. So it's a natural love. When you love a person who's not related, it's for a reason. You admire their midas, you admire their knowledge, you admire other talents that they have, you admire something about them, and because of that, you love that person. By the love of a father to a son is a natural love, not based on reason. So this love comes from a place which is, in a sense, not the essence, essence of Hashem. It comes from a place where there is some relationship that because of that, Hashem loves the neshama. In other words, the love for the neshama is because of the greatness of the neshama. The neshama has so many qualities to it. The neshama is, comes from Hashem. But the love that the Ebeshta has, mitzad the guf, it's not because of the maila of the guf, because the guf has no mailas. The guf is flesh and blood, and there's no maila there. Gam loy maila de ben maila atzmis. With the neshama, you say the neshama is chelik alakami mal mamish. It comes from the essence of Hashem. So that's the love that Hashem has for the neshama. But the guf is just something physical. There's absolutely no quality in the guf. Nevertheless, the fact that Hashem loves the guf is mitzat shakodesh baruchu bochar beguf the yisrael bebchiru chavshes. So bchiru zuhi meatz musay. Whenever it gets to the subject of bchira, it always gets very complicated. But bchira means choosing, and the ultimate, the ultimate uh, true definition of choosing and making a choice and choosing something freely means that there's nothing there that's compelling me to choose one way or the other. And it's just because I chose, because I chose to choose, not because there's something there. In other words, normally when we choose something, in a sense, you can say that even before you made the choice, I could have told you what the person's going to choose. If I know the nature of this person, and I know the nature of the what he has to choose from, I could have told you in advance that this person's probably going to choose A. And I could have told you in advance that the other person's going to choose B. Why? Because this person has a certain nature, a certain personality. They, they have different characteristics than the other person. So therefore, they're probably going to want this over that. And the other person is going to want that over this. When you're talking about the ultimate pira, it means I'm not choosing because of a reason. I'm not choosing because I want this particular quality. But I'm choosing simply because I, from my end, chose. There's nothing there that drew me to one over the other. It's my choice to choose A over B. That comes from the essence. So in other words, if I'm choosing something, of course, let's say I'm a kind person, so I, I like this kind person, or I like this thing, which is an act of kindness, it means it's not my essence, it's my kindness that's causing me to choose. If I, for example, are passionate about music, and therefore I'm drawn to something which is musical, or to a person who's talented in music and a great musician, so I'm drawn to that person, is the music in me that draws me in that direction. If I'm an intellectual and I meet someone who's brilliant, is the chokhmah in me that draws me to that person. Is the chesed in me, it's not my essence. It's whatever quality I'm carrying draws me to the other thing. But if I'm not being drawn to the other thing because of any quality whatsoever, then where's it coming from? My essence. Again, I, I am acknowledging this is a hard concept, but you get the idea, at least on some level, right? So this is the difference between the neshama and the guf. With the neshama, there's reason to, uh, uh, to choose the neshama. There's a connection there. The neshama is spiritual. The neshama has love for Hashem. The neshama has all the qualities that it has. And when Hashem chooses it, we can say that choice doesn't come from the essence. But the choosing the guf, in fact, one might think that in the Gov, there is no difference between the Yid and anybody else. Everybody's the same. The only difference between a Yid and the rest of the world is the Neshama. But the Alter Rebbe says in Tanya, it's a famous chapter in Tanya, chapter Memtes 49, where the Alter Rebbe explains that the, the choice of Hashem is not only also to the Gov, but actually the greatest quality of Bechira is with the Gov more than with the Neshama. 
So this is another way of saying that the root and the source of the gulf comes from a higher and a deeper place within Hashem than the root of the neshama. The gulf, in a sense, comes from Hashem's essence, and the neshama comes from Hashem's chokhmah, or even if it's deeper than chokhmah, but not the essence. I want to add another thing, which also applies to the guf. Yeah. Yes. So you said that the guf comes from Hashem's essence, and then the neshama comes from Hashem's chokhmah. Right. Actually, he's talking about the, the love and the bond between Hashem and the guf. Yeah. Well, when Hashem was creating Adam and Rishon, he blew in his neshama. So, and then there's like a whole discussion of how like blowing comes from a different place than speaking. So if he blew in the neshama, then when in the neshama comes from the essence? Right. What, remember what it says in Tanya that we're comparing blowing to speaking. Mm-hmm. When you speak, you don't exert energy. That means it's coming from an external place. And that's why a person could speak for a very long time and not get tired. When a person blows, you can't blow for a long time. You blow for a few seconds, even a few minutes, and then you, you can't do it anymore. You, you can hold your breath. Because blowing comes from a deeper place. So when we compare the way Hashem created the rest of the world through speech, and he created the neshama through blowing, in that context, blowing is deeper than speech. But when we talk about uh, what we're saying now, that the, that, the, the, that Hashem in his essence chose the guf. That's another aspect. In that sense, the guf comes from a deeper source than the neshama. On the contrary, the more I understand the greatness of the neshama and the depth of the neshama and how the neshama is rooted in the deepest place within Hashem, the more meaning it has when I say that the guf comes from even a deeper place. First of all, there's a general concept in general that the Gashmias, the world, comes from Hashem's essence. Now, again, this is also one of the most, most, most fundamental things in Chassidus, even though it's one of the deep philosophical concepts of Chassidus. But again, there's a chapter in Tanya, not in the first part, not in the second part, not in the third part, it's in the fourth part of Tanya, known as the Geras HaKodesh. And it's in chapter 20. And this is something that Alter Rebbe wrote a few days before his istalka, before his passing. He revealed something in the Chassidus, which is considered one of the deepest concepts. And what is it? That Bechlal, the creation of Gashmius, comes from the essence, essence of Hashem, more than all the Ruch Nuzika worlds. And the reason for that is, and that's Gashmius, literally physical matter that we have in this physical world, that has to come from the essence of Hashem. And the reason for that is because Gashmis is Yeshmi Ayin. means something from nothing. There's no apparent source to this. When yes, tell me, where does this come from? The way it appears is as if it has no beginning. It just is. The physical world, the earth, <laughs> it's in the spiritual world, every level in the spiritual world, higher or lower, they feel, they sense that they come from a higher source. The only place where there's no sense of any higher source, it's as if as if this is where it all began, is the Gashmis of the world. That's Elam Hazer Gashmi. So the Alter Rebbe says, these, these are the simple words. There's a lot, a lot of deep philosophy behind it. But the simple words are, this can only come from a place in the spiritual realm, which is also like that, that it has no source. Which place in the spiritual realm has no source? Only Hashem's essence. What's the source of the world of Yitzira? What? Hashem's essence. No, right. I'm talking about in the chain of, oh, of worlds. Bria. Bria. What's the source of the world of Bria? What's the source of Atsilus? Kesser. What's the source of Kesser? Atikim. Oh, very good. What's the source of Atik Yemen? Everest, Mount Everest now. What's the source of Atik Yemen? What? So, Ainsev. What's the source of Ainsev? So there's more. On top of Kesar, there's something called Akudim. On top of Akudim, there's something called Adam Kadman. On top of Adam Kadman, there's something called Erin Sof, Shalifnat Simtsum. 
on top of Eir and Sarshlin and Simpson, there's Etzim Eir, there's this Pashtas Eir. So this comes from that, and that comes from this, and the, this oath and that. Ultimately, everything comes from someplace else. What doesn't come from anything else above it? Hashem's essence. So it's only the Hashem's essence, which has no source preceding it, can create a physical object that exists as if it has no source preceding it. But everything else, because it has a source preceding it, is not capable of creating something that you could not see that it has a source preceding it. That's what it says in Tanya. Are those all worlds that you could mention? Like, why were you saying there's only four worlds when there's so many worlds before I see those things? Right, we don't call them worlds. They have different names. The, world, the word world, by definition, means already more finite. These are all levels, even though how could there be levels in infinite, but they're all levels in infinite. Do they also have the spheres? <laughs> and they have a different name. It's called Esses Spheres Agnusis, which means it's not really spheres, it's the source for spheres. And there's uh, a source on one level, and a source on a higher level, and a higher level. Not That's first. going to be the third year of Machon, the Mirza Shem. <laughs> it's not Chesed Vortiferis. It's the source for Chesed Vortiferis, but in a different way. In other words, the beginning of spheres only begins with Atzil. Before that, there is no spheres. But there's something there which is the source of spheres. There's another level which is not a source, but it's a source for the source. But there's another level, it's not the source to the source, but it's the source to the source of the source. And it keeps going on there. Even that, it didn't exist before. It's only the source of the source for Chokhmah. Anyway, so Gashmi's Bechlal comes from Hashem's essence. And here he's saying that the same as with the love. The love and the choice that Hashem chooses, the guf, that comes from his essence. Tatka the guf that has no, doesn't carry any qualities to it. There's nothing in the guf that's a quality that is more than the Hashem has all the qualities. as intellect and emotion and chokhmah and bina and the ten spheres. The guf is just flat, technical piece of matter. And it comes from a place that also has no qualities, it's just the essence. But the Hashem's essence is beyond all qualities. And the guf is below all qualities. But that's where the guf comes from, and that's what it's associated with, with Hashem's essence. So therefore, the guf does have a higher source than the Hashem. <coughs> now let's go after the bracket. In fact, the reason why the neshama is drawn to give life to the guf, that's in fact the reason why the neshama wants to come down, go into the body and give life to the body because the source and the root of the guf is higher than the neshama. So in a sense, the neshama wants to gain the mila of the guf. And by going into the guf, the neshama becomes connected to that higher level of Hashem's love and Hashem's choosing. In other words, generally speaking, anything ruchnius usually goes upward. Gashmius goes downward. Like, for example, the neshama in itself is compared to fire. What does it say in Tanya about fire? Fire by nature always goes upward. You take a match and you turn it upside down, the flame will go up. Heat rises. Gashmius, especially the two elements of water and earth, they go downward. So the neshama goes upward. And what is it that brings the neshama to go into the guf? And it says, it's actually against its will. The neshama doesn't want to go into the guf. You, the, the, we learned in, in, in Perki Avos and explained in Tanya that one moment in that spiritual world is greater than a lifetime, an entire lifetime in the physical world. All the pleasures of a person would have all the pleasures of the physical world on a constant basis, not even one second interruption of no pleasure, it wouldn't compare to one second. So why does the Neshama want to go into a Gashmizdika world, which has all the Gashmizdika challenges and concealments? And the answer is because the Neshama knows that the Gulf has something that it doesn't have. And when the Neshama goes into the Gulf, it gets connected to that. What is it? The Gulf's Sherish, the Gulf's roots and source is higher than the Neshama. And that's why it says, that when the neshama doesn't want to leave the body because it understands the mila that the body has over the neshama. So the guf has a mila over the neshama. And similarly, 
when you talk about Torah and mitzvahs, mitzvahs have a mila over Torah. Yeah. So why is there so long? Like, where people are always trying to like press their ghosts and like get rid of their ghosts and like fast? And because this is according. To, because this is exactly what it says in the Bible. Very good question. Nigla, according to the revealed way, the way we see things in a revealed way, the guf is low and the neshama is high. What you're learning now is pnimis and what it says in chassidus, what it says in Kabbalah. So when you learn that, then you start talking about the root, the spiritual root. The spiritual root, the guf is higher than the neshama. But if you don't talk about the spiritual root, in every level, the neshama, the guf is gross, and the guf is physical. The guf is drawn to all sort of physical pleasures. The guf doesn't want to uh, uh, do spirit, anything that's spiritual, and you have to force it. So therefore, the guf is definitely lower. And in order to be able to grow spiritually, the approach was to suppress the guf. Only once the hidden secrets of Torah began to surface. And we began to understand that actually there's something in the guf which is infinitely, not a little bit, but infinitely greater than the shama. Now we have more respect for the guf. That was like during the Shem Tov. That started with the That's when said, no more fasting, no more doing those things that sort of torment the body as a way, of, even though it was done as a way of tshuva. But before the Baal Shem Tov, the way to enhance the neshama is by putting down the guf. And from the Baal Shem Tov and on, the way to enhance the neshama has to be with the guf, because there's actually something in the guf. So why not before? Because this mile of the guf was hidden before, and we couldn't relate to that. And now it's becoming revealed. Why Baal Shem Tov? Because that was the beginning, and that was sort of orientation, getting closer to the times of Mashiach. That's when it's going to become revealed in a complete way. And that's when, that's why, because on Mashiach, the guf is going to get like, Exactly. All the things we're talking about, Chisamesh, we'll soon see that because the guf is greater than the Shama once we understand the source. <laughs> Got it? Holding on? Yeah. Okay. Got the Shama, guf. Gashmis, Ruchnias, spiritual, physical. The spiritual is higher than the physical without question, but the source of the Gashmis is higher than the Ruchnias. Ine, Yadua, it's known. Shazer, Shabachi, Vakim, Amitzvis. When it comes to Mitzvis, call you soul, him Shodan. All Yidden are equal. Moshe Rabbeinu's <laughs> obligation to eat matzah is no different than the obligation. <laughs> of the simplest Jew to eat matzah. It's supposed to be the same matzah made from flour and water, and the shear is the same shear, kezayis. But when it comes to limitere, yesh kama v'kam madregis. The b'yesh v'yel, those people, that their occupation is in the tents of Torah, which means they don't, they're not occupied with gosh musical work, they're either a rabbi in a shul or a teacher in a school or they're a student in a yeshiva. So yesh them p'nai, they have the time to learn more Torah. they have the obligation where it says in the Pasuk, to toil and to labor in Torah study by day and by night, literally, which means as much time as you possibly can. Of course, you need a little bit of time for your personal needs. You have to eat, you have to sleep, you have other personal needs to take care of. And beyond that, be learning all the hours of the day. In fact, I mentioned the other day, this is the Pasuk, which is the source that learning Torah has to be by day and night, which is a man who learns Torah all day, doesn't learn at night, is really not fulfilling the mitzvah. It doesn't say how many hours by day and how many hours by night, but there has to be some learning by day, has to be some learning by night. And yes, there's people who are bali asokim, they're people who are engaged in parnasa, in ordinary parnasa. They could be yeser, the obligation of learning Torah by learning perik echad chakras, just one chapter of Torah in the morning, perik echad arvis, and one chapter of Torah at night, because you have to learn day and night. And that's it. And that can be enough for them. The rest of the time, they need the time for their panasa. And if you can ask me, what if you don't need so much time? So you're right. If you don't need so much time for your panasa, then you should be learning more time. 
But according to this, there's no set time for everybody or anybody. Everybody has a different uh, obligation. This person, based on their lifestyle, they're obligated to learn 10 hours a day. And this person is supposed to be learning 18 hours a day. And this person could be learning a half hour a day. And this person could be learning 10 minutes a day. And they're all being fulfilling their mitzvah of Talmud Torah. So how is it? Then it comes to all the mitzvahs, it's set for everybody. Comes to Torah, it's not the same. The reason is, ki mitzvahs heim rotsin elvin kanal, because mitzvahs come from Hashem's rotsin. Rotsin ulu maylem is chalkus, and rotsin is something that's not divided. And Torah chokmasu is baruch. Torah is Hashem's chokma, and chokma yesh is chalkus. This again is a whole, it's a whole uh, segment in Chassidus about what the difference is between Chochmah and Rotsen. So we definitely can cover it all, just to little, give a little bit of an idea what it means. But what he's saying is, first let's get the words straight, and then we'll give the explanation. The words are that mitzvahs come from Hashem's Rotsen, the highest source. Rotsen is, we said before, Keser, that's Hashem's Ein Sof, that's infinite. Infinite has no parts. In infinite, there are no levels. There's no beginning. There's no end. There's no middle. That's why infinite is always uh, described symbolically by a circle. <coughs> the circle doesn't have a beginning. It doesn't have an end. It doesn't have a middle. Every angle in the circle is exactly the same as the other. That's one kind of diagram. Then the other diagram is a straight line. These are the language actually in Kabbalah. Ein Saf is called eagle. And the light, which is finite, is called kav, which is a line. In a line, there is the beginning of the line and the end of the line. And every dot that's closer to the beginning is higher. Every dot that's further from the beginning is lower. So basically, in the finite realm, there are halakim, there are, there are parts. So therefore, when it comes to learning Torah, there are levels. One could learn on one level. One has an obligation to learn an hour a day. One has an obligation to learn two minutes a day. And one has an obligation to learn 18 hours a day. When it comes to mitzvahs, because it comes from a place where there's no parts, there's no differences, so everyone has the same exact obligation. Yeah. Kav is the finite light, the light which is limited. Is it, is it an light? Yeah, the same thing as the encompassing light. This is different words. Of course, there are little details, but generally it's all the same. If you say Erhabligwal means the infinite light. Sayyid Kalamun is the infinite light. Kesser is the infinite light. Ainsaf is the infinite light. So once you get a little bit more familiar with the language of Hasidus, you see that it's all interconnected. <laughs> And Rasen is Hashem's Kesa, the will. What goes above Chachma? What's Kesa? Kesa is the will. What, what I would like to explain, though, is how does, this, how does it uh, manifest in the two faculties of will and intellect? To say that intellect has parts and will has no division, no parts. So this, I have time to think about it until tomorrow. Bring that Tomorrow's shir will go into that. Okay, so at the end of the book, by the way, we made a little chart. We covered, we covered most of them. Difference between Terry and Mitzvah. Let's do this quickly. Terry is compared to the blood. Mitzvah is compared to the body. Terry is not limited in time. Tayyar primarily influenced the Neshama, Mitzvah primarily influenced the Guf. The source of Tayyar is Chokhmah, the source of Mitzvah is Ratzin. Tayyar provides the explanation to the Mitzvahs, Mitzvahs are the actual observance. In Mitzvahs, everyone is the same. But in Tayyar, there are differences from one person to another. That's where we're up to. And the next part of the Maimon will explain seven and eight. Okay, to be continued in your Tashem. Thank you. Thank you. We have what? Yeah. Let's see if we still have any here. If not, I'll make a copy.
These are all Hebrew. So I will ask Mrs. Yaffin to make a copy. Then. Anybody else want to copy in English? What's this? No. Okay, let me just double check the attendance here. Okay. So have a good day, everybody. Thank you. 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 Thank you.